All right, guys. Welcome to Million Browser Botnet. Uh, I'm Matt Johansson. I'm Jeremiah Grossman. Uh, we both work for uh, White House Security. Well, work, work for is a loose term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. So uh, we're here from White House Security. It's a little bit about what we do. Uh, the entire talk here is going to be about browser security, which is rather ironic since most of what we do is website security. Uh, the company headquarters is in Santa Clara. We've been around for about 12 years all of that time hacking websites and finding vulnerabilities in them. So it's a really fun job to hack, be able to hack hundreds and hundreds of banks and retailers and healthcare providers whenever you feel like it. Uh, our little twist, if you want to call it vulnerability assessment, um, is a software as a service platform where we constantly hack the same sites over and over and over again. Um, so we get to do a lot of research in the meantime. And uh, right now we're about 340 employees. Uh, about 140 of those were hired since about January of this time last year. So we've been doing pretty well. We have about 20,000 sites under service, so that's kind of our giant data pool that we, we come to this presentation with that data in the back of our minds. Uh, just a little bit about my, my background. Uh, so my background is all web security, so I can break browsers, break websites, and code and all that kind of stuff, but don't let me touch your DSL routers or anything like that, or PIX firewalls. I won't know what the hell I'm doing with them. Uh, but I spend about, uh, I have three basic jobs. One is I talk to a lot of companies all over the world about their web security challenges, what works, what doesn't work, and I try to learn from them. It's a big part of the job is to learn from the people in the field doing, uh, doing the defense work. Second part of my job is since we're hacking all those websites all the time, we get great analytics, you know, who's vulnerable to what and how often. So I take what customers teach me and then I learn from stuff at work on hundreds of terabytes of data. And then third part of the job is why I'm here, is to share back out the things that I learned with everybody else. And uh, yeah, I also, uh, I started just hacking websites uh, day in and day out and I turned to the dark side of management. At least it wasn't sales, though, right? Um, and uh, so now I lead a hacker army uh, of, you know, I think, what's our department at? Like 120, 120 uh, web hackers. Uh, I, I head up the team out in Houston, formerly in Santa Clara, and I'm hiring a ton. Um, as he said, we, we've kind of blown up. So if, you got, if you're looking for an entry-level AppSec job, come talk to me, Houston or Santa Clara. Um, that's enough about us. Okay, so that's us. That's what we do. Uh, now, I'm at an AppSec conference. I'm going to try to teach you guys the way the web works. <laughs> so uh, bear with me here. But So we know a lot about the way the web works. You guys know how SSL works, how HTTP works, and basic things like that. But the things I'm going to describe for you are just the fundamentals of the way web security or the web is supposed to work. So right now, when you go to a web page, you download some combination of HTML, Cascadia style speech in JavaScript. For that moment in time, that web page has near complete control over your web browser to do anything that it wants. Your web browser, not your operating system, that will require some other kind of vulnerability in your browser. But now, alongside with that power, the code that you're downloading from that website, we get to do things like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, click jacking, and a, and a whole host of other tricks. So we're going to talk about those things. And these things, when you really look at it, we call them vulnerabilities, but the, the nature of it and the reason they, they work is because this is the way the web was intended to be designed. This is how it works. So I'm going to go over these basic names here. And a lot of you might be familiar with these concepts. But this is kind of to illustrate the things that can happen to your browser right at the moment that you hit a web page. And there's nothing that you can do to patch against them. This is every one of 2 billion people online is affected by these. And it doesn't matter what browser you use. So we got things like browser interrogation, evil cross-site request forgery, login detection, de-anonymization, internet hacking, auto cross-site scripting. That's always fun. Drive-by downloads, you guys know a lot about that. Uh, and the last two, not a whole lot of people know about, but nonetheless very fun. It's distributed brute force hash cracking and application level DDoS, all in the browser. So a quote before we move on from this slide, I really like this. It's, uh, this quote comes from a blog series that Jeremiah wrote called the I Know series. How, how many of you guys have, have read this one? No one. Oh my gosh, you got to go do it. Uh, so, th so this quote, uh, it, I, 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 I'm going to read it directly because I don't want to do it in, any injustice. It says, unless you've taken very particular precautions, assume every website you visit knows exactly who you are and where you're from. Uh, it's a pretty powerful message to kind of get in the back of your brain, right? Unless you're, unless you're very particularly protecting against yourself, uh, yourself against this stuff, it's, it's all on by default. All right. So you go to a website. Uh, you guys heard of Core Metrics, Google Analytics, thousand other trackers out there. 
if you fire up your browser and you run it through a proxy or you know a little web a uh, little third party uh, plugin on any one of the browsers you'll th see things like this i got this from cnn so this is a widget on the website loading up information about my browser's user agent plugins fonts you know colors screen dimensions and it fires it all off to cnn.com to metrics.cnn.com and they capture it they capture as much information as they possibly can for analytical purposes. I'd imagine everything that's good for them and not so good for me, at least my privacy anyway. But they get all this information. This is very, very helpful for CNN, but also for the bad guys website that you might be visiting because they're not using any exploit. This is just plain JavaScript they used to do this. There's nothing particularly special about it. Probably do this in 30 lines. So that's one. Let's move on to something a little bit more aggressive. Now, I mentioned before that when you go to a website, that website can force your browser to make any web request it wants, generally speaking, to any location on the web, on the web or on the internet. Now, normally these things are for images and cascading styles teach in JavaScript, but there's nothing that says my, the browser can't be forced to hack other websites. For instance, the first one here is you could force a browser to do a SQL injection command on some target web server in the world and force them to hack another web server. You can just use one image tag and you could force them to download illegal content off some torrent server, uh, make them search for embarrassing things such as Justin Bieber fan club. Uh, you can for, you know, perform business logic flaw attacks on different banking websites and things like that, or you can cause them to vote on this and things. Your creativity is the only limiter if you're the bad guy. So any request, any location, get or post, internet or intranet, it's all there. Let's move on one step. Now, at this point, I know who the user is and I can make them do my bidding, but I, don't, I really want to know, like, before I force them to make requests, I would like them to be authenticated, so I'm going to see what websites that they're logged into. So uh, there is a, you can have, have the slides later, but if you see the little URL up here, it's part of the I know your web browser series, but this little snippet of code here um, that I put uh, hotwired in JavaScript into a library does login detection on the browser. So essentially what I do is I force the browser to make a particular web request to any one of these services, Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, Google, Amazon, LinkedIn, and Reddit. And depending on the response that comes back from the website and how it responds, I can tell if the user's logged into any of those particular services. So right when you hit a web page, I know which one of these services you're actively using, and it becomes much more interesting to hack a user that's logged into Yahoo or Twitter at the time that you do so. All good? Okay. Now, let's just say for the sake of argument, you are logged into Twitter or Facebook. I know it's kind of rare, right? <laughs> now, I notice that you're logged into Facebook, and I decide, let's put a like button over a dancing cat thing. And every place you move your mouse, I make the like button hover just under your mouse, and for good measure, I make it transparent. You click somewhere on the screen, the dancing cat, or get whatever you want, and you forcibly like something that the bad guy controls, and it says, Jeremiah Grossman just liked this particular thing on Facebook. Now, I've only served up that, like per that, like, that particular like button for that resource to one person ever. So since they're logged into Facebook, I've only served it to one person. Now I've done de-anonymization with a single click, and the user didn't know it. You can do the same thing with Twitter follow buttons. So the moment that you click on anything on the web page, which is kind of the antithesis of what you're supposed to do online, you give up your identity information in a heartbeat. So one click, I know you are. Now I mentioned several times uh, how you can force a browser to do your bidding, but what most people forget out there is that you can do intranet hacking this way as well. And uh, this was first discussed, uh, I discussed it back in 2006 at Black Hat, it remains unfixed to this day that I can force your browser to make web requests to the inside of the firewall and, well, just hit just about anything else and backdoor routers and things like that. So your internet is fair game, and again, not much you can do about it in, the, in today's browser. It's on by default. If you know cross-site scripting vulnerabilities ahead of time, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and pick your website, I can force you to cross-site script yourself with an iframe using those and get control over that domain, very easy. This kind of gets to be a reoccurring thing. There's not much you can't do in a browser. Drive-by downloads with iframes, you guys know how these work, these happen a million times a day. You just load them up. And there's two more here, I'm going to ask Matt to cover them. Yeah, so th this whole list of things that we're going through is, is things that you can uh, do with a browser, right? So keep this in mind as we go through this and we're going to get into our technique and actually get to this whole million browser botnet. These are all things that we could do 
with this browser botnet, right? Uh, so this is one that we did a little bit more research on, the end of this, this list here, right, is uh, distributed brute force hash cracking. What would be a really good use of a browser botnet? Well, it's already distributed, right, just by nature of what it is as a botnet. Uh, well, let's crack some hashes, let's actually crack some passwords. So this research, researcher actually has already done this and, and released this tool and uh, has gotten some pretty impressive uh, crack rates with just using JavaScript uh, in a browser. So as you can see, he did you know he, he reached six figures at MD5 hashes per second uh, in in guessing in guessing these things and cracking them. So the tool that he released is called Ravon. Uh, you can go look it up now. Uh, it's it's actually uh, it, it does one little trick besides just using JavaScript in your browser to crack hashes. It uses what's called web workers. Who's familiar with web workers in the browser? Cool, a bunch of you. Um, so. This allows that 100,000 to multiply a number of times in a single browser. So with one browser, I think you can get 12 mm -hmm. web workers. Is anyone 10, 10 or, what is 10 it, 10 or 12? 12? So, something around there. You can, you can get more than just your one browser. You can kind of treat your browser as a, an additional nine browsers. Uh, and and it, it, looked like, uh, it looks like it, it got a little bit lower here. And you can see each one of these workers got down to about uh, almost 70,000 hashes per second that he was uh, guessing. So you can download these slides, look up these URLs, it's a really cool project. So this is, this is the big one that we're going to focus on for the rest of the presentation, is application level distributed denial of service tax. Um, so again, this isn't anything new in particular, the attack. Um, a browser can send a really large number of requests, uh, you know, using cross-origin requests written in JavaScript, same researcher, 10,000 requests per minute from one browser. Um, so uh, th this is more of a traditional di distributed denial of service attack. Uh, we didn't think that was big enough. <laughs> we wanted to do something a little bit different and we also were worried about the actual distribution of that JavaScript into these browsers to create this attack. We wanted to, okay, how, how can you get enough browsers to run your malicious JavaScript to try to uh, denial of service some other website? Uh, so we, we looked into uh, the ways to maximize the number of HTTP connections that a single browser can hold open at any single time. Um, it turns out that number is six. Um, as you see here, do you want to talk about browsers? Too? Sure. So, so if, at this point, we're just covering the basics here, everything that we've known thus far. One browser can do all the things we just discussed. We're just going to focus on denial of service, which is not to say we can't force a million browsers to do all that other stuff, but we're just going to focus on DOS because it was easy to measure. So when you, your browser interacts with a website and you have all, like a whole bunch of image tags going to a singular website, the browser will max out at six simultaneous connections per host name. That's all you get. It has to wait for the rest to come back before another one is initiated. So that's what you see in this browser scope thing here. Now, all these browsers here have the same limit on HTTP. But there's this strange little side effect that happens on Firefox, which they, I believe they consider not a bug. And I'll show you how this works. Demo? Oh, yeah. Demo. yeah. We'll come back to the code. Want to just demo first? Yeah, we have a video demo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see? A little small, huh? Sorry. We'll kind of narrate. Can you guys at least see these numbers in the, in the, bottom, in the bottom left here? In the back? Can you guys see these? No? Okay. I probably just do the full Let's screen see. there. No, oh. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Bummer. I knew that was going to happen. Let's see if I can get this corner here. That's about as good as we're going to get. All right. So I'll do my best narrate. To, to narrate. <laughs> In this first tab here is just a straight vanilla Apache server 2.4.4. If that's not the latest version, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. This, ver this here is the uh, Apache logs just being tailed. And I'm just hitting the status page over and over again to get these metrics here. And you can see here at the bottom here, there's one, sim one request being made, currently being made and being processed. This is my HTML page that the, ba that the user would land on that forces them to make a connection to my test, my victim server, as it were. Right here, I'm going to loop through the creation of a whole bunch of, uh, of image tags, a, a whole lot of them. And notice the browser will only send six to seven at a time to the website. So right now, it's just getting six or seven to the web server and it's maxing out because that's all the browser will send in any given amount of time. Okay. So just a note about this, this is not a security feature, this is a performance feature, mm -hmm. right, for uh, loading images on a page. 
So that will get done. Yeah, plus pause. Is the max connections an about config setting that you can tweak with JavaScript? Yes. It's a, yes, you can't. You can make. You can change it in Firefox, not in Chrome, because they don't have an about config. It's hard coded in config files pre-compile. And even then, I do believe there is a max. I don't. I don't know what it is offhand. All right. So uh, you want to rotate that back down to zero because we don't need it anymore. Now, right here. Can you pause here, Matt? Uh, right there. This right here. This is a for loop that creates image tags. But instead of HTTP, I flipped it to FTP. And then I pointed the, the colon, because FTP defaults to port 21, I put it back to port 80. Okay? And then I'm going to cycle it. Okay. So this is a connection limit bypass in Firefox. So you'll see the, the request currently being processed. I know in the back it's hard to see, but the number, the, the number in the furthest bottom left corner is, is what we're looking at. So when I wrote this, this up to, like, let's say, 20. And you notice it goes up to 21 right there rather than maxing out at 7. So we're leveraging the browser. So right here, Apache is still cool. You know, no problem. I can do 20 simultaneous connections. And you notice here, it, it should come up in a second, but a, a Apache and certain Apache installations will have very weird ways of like dealing with it. So now I'm going to rotate it up to 400. You'll see this, what happens right here at the bottom, 266. And this is where Apache dies. So one browser on Firefox, Apache dies. Dead. It fills up the connection pole on Apache. So we're trying to refresh the status page here, yeah. and it's, it's not refreshing anymore. Yeah. Um, the other weird thing about the Same. FTP, and when we switch over there, is that it stops coming up in the logs, in the tail logs. Like, you don't, you're not seeing that, that traffic anymore. So now, so if you're a bad guy running a blog, a Firefox browser comes to your page, you use this FTP trick, you point them at a web server, and you kill that, you kill that web server. Pretty easy. This is all with one browser, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're just showing how dead it is for the next 10 seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Apache has a hard-coded connection limit of 255 simultaneous connections, and we max that out with FTP. So that's, that's the extent of the code that you need to do that. It's a little bit bigger for, for those of you who had a hard time seeing the code, right? It's, it's pretty easy. Uh, just a little for loop. Yep. So what is that? Six lines of JavaScript? Fun. Yep. All right. So everything that we've learned so far, uh, no malware to detect. There's no exploits. No zero days. Can't patch it. There's no traces. There's very few alarms. And we can prevent browser caching in case we wanted to get the code off of everybody's browser. We can do that. Everyone's browser is vulnerable. This is super, super easy. And best of all, it's meant to work this way. Super. I mean, look. Everyone can kind of read this code, right? Like, you know, this is this is literally the the entirety of the code that we wrote during all of this research. Um, it, it's it's really easy, and we're just loading image tags. So the the web is supposed to load image tags, right? <laughs> uh, so kind of a point that I touched on earlier, right? Is how do we get this JavaScript out into these browsers? Uh, to to run it, right? To actually try to generate any sort of Attack, uh, the, be it denial of service, hash cracking, the auto access, auto C surf, all the stuff that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, so these are all the traditional ways of distributing that. You guys have heard of all of this. None of this is new, right? These things have been talked about for years, right? You can do some phishing. You can uh, put it on, put the JavaScript on your own website. You can do it man in the middle, inject the JavaScript back on the response. You can search engine poison. Uh, I don't think any of this is big enough. Right? I don't think any of these methodologies of distributing the JavaScript is going to be big enough to generate enough traffic to actually do a legitimate DDoS attack and cause anyone any problems. Um, so We're going to invoke Crockford. We're going to invoke the Crockford, as Gerald said. <laughs> so about, oh man, what's a, like February, March of last year, uh, Mr. Crockford, who Wrote, the, wrote several books on JavaScript, I think, um, says the most reliable, cost-effective method to inject evil code is to buy an ad. So we did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> we bought a few of them. So how many of you are familiar with how the advertising ecosystem actually works? Like, OK, a few of you. Cool. So for those of you who don't know, it's not just, hey, I would like to advertise on your website. Here's you know, some money, and here's an ad, and please put your ad on your website. There's these middlemen called advertising networks that are going to do all of this 
for you. So I'm an advertiser. I'd like my ad to start showing up in as many browsers as possible. So when I say browsers, you can think people or you know, they, they're going to think people. Impressions is a, is a word that they're going to use. You're, you're usually charging by impressions. I had to learn this whole new language in advertising land of, of, of the words that they used, right? So uh, I'm going to go to them. Here's my ad. Here's my money. I want, you know, uh, I'm going to put as much money in here and I, it's going to cost X amount per thousand impressions, right? And when I hear impressions, I think browsers. And they go ahead and distribute that ad through, through whoever they have relationships with, be it, you know, Facebook or other blogs or news sites or whatever it is, right? So for example, we were sitting uh, in a speaker prep room the first time we gave this talk and we were like, okay, what's a, what's a site with a lot of ads? I just want to take a screenshot, maybe, I don't know. We, we were just kind of messing around trying to see what we could add. We were like, well, TMZ probably has a ton of ads, right? <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff you're used to seeing, right? You go to an advertising network, so this free credit score company went you know, to the advertising network, gave them this banner, gave them money, and it just happened to show up. If I refresh this page, it'll be a different one, right? We just thought it was really funny we had to include it, because it said, ad serving done right, see what's possible. I was like, okay, yeah, I think we will, right? <laughs> like, we're gonna actually see what's possible. I don't think that's what they meant, um, but we're going to. Um, so here's a bunch of these advertising networks. We, we had to put a little disclaimer because we realized with our template, it looked like we were one of them. <laughs> White Hat, not an advertising network. Uh, so here are all these other ones. Um, you guys have probably heard of some of the bigger ones like DoubleClick. Uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, Google AdSense, some of these don't allow you to actually give them your JavaScript and then them just turn it around and, and dish it out everywhere, but a lot of them do without blinking, right? So here's money, here's my JavaScript, go, right? And they go. Um, but we, we, we realized that they were some of the smaller ad networks, um, so uh, Jeremiah tried to, tried to use some clout, <laughs> and, uh, and this is an email we got back. Do you want to talk about that? I was, uh so I was disappointed that some of them didn't allow JavaScript in their ads, so I asked if I could pay more money. <laughs> if we ask nicely, <laughs> will they let us put the JavaScript in? And they said yes. Uh, the only third-party code we allow is that from large ad-serving companies like DoubleClick and such who we trust. Okay, at least you trust them, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're already doing the vulnerability scanning, so yeah, cool. <laughs> They're trustworthy. We're definitely not. Well, we weren't, so good on them. But, um, so... Then there's another type of service out there that we had never heard of until we were doing this research that we also utilized in this attack. Um, it, it worked a lot uh, in the same way that uh, as the ad network did as far as our purposes go. There was no advertising being sold or transacted, but it was actually browser renting time. You just rent browser time. You give them money for X amount of browser time, CPU time, and that's it, right? So for about 12.50, we got 10,000 minutes of browser time to just, you give them a URL and they guarantee uh, over some interval of 10,000 minutes that a browser or multiple browsers will be on that URL. I, I, don't, I cannot think of a legitimate purpose for this, for this company to exist. I really, I have no idea. Uh, but it works for us terrifically uh, because we were, uh, we were generating legit traffic. Yeah, we, yeah, a lot of traffic, right? Um, but uh, why this was useful was because in advertising network land, when I said these impressions that we were paying for, there is no guarantee on time, right? And if you're doing something like hash cracking, you remember the the other slide? It was how many per second that you could crack. Well, what if my ad was only on for one second for each of these thousand browsers? That's, you know, I don't I have no guarantee. Here I have 10,000 minutes guaranteed, right? It's not all at once, but it's guaranteed and it's dirt cheap. Um, so yeah, we're gonna focus on these three. I don't know why the slide's here. So the, the part that we thought was really cool about this, and as we were going through a lot of uh, these ad networks, is the economics are just ridiculous. Um, it is really, really cheap. It goes from right around a penny to $5, uh, and this is per thousand impressions that, that we're going off. Per right? thousand browsers. So yeah, you can hear browsers, you could also hear bots. These all words are gonna mean the same thing in this presentation, right? So per thousand bots in my botnet, the one that we wound up going with was 50 cents, okay? So 50 cents per thousand bots in the botnet. So the million browser botnet would cost you $500. I just did math, watch out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this was really, really easy, really, really cheap. In the entirety of the, the research that we were doing, uh, we hadn't spent $10. Um, 
while we were dosing ourselves over and over again, and we'll get to that. Uh, we tried to crank it up, like, and spend a lot of money, and we put like seventy bucks in it. I mean, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll get to it later. We wound up putting a, a decent amount more cash in it, but still, we never hit five hundred bucks or anything like that. So this is kind of what it looks like when you go to an ad network. This is kind of the the browser panel that they that they're going to give you, uh, and this is where I had to learn a lot of their terminology. So. Since I'm probably the only person that's ever used an ad network in the way that I'm using it, uh, a lot of this stuff just didn't matter to me. Uh, so I had to try to figure out how to navigate these waters of like which kind of keyword lists I would like to target and <laughs> uh, geolocations I would like to target. I don't care as long as it's a browser, right? I didn't care. So I picked computers as the keyword. I'm sorry, all of you. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I just I just tried to wildcard everything, right? Yeah, I send it everywhere all the time. Just get through this. But they, they give you very granular control here of where your ad is served up. So in my mind, they give you very granular control here over where my malicious JavaScript is served up. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, so they do all the targeting for me. I don't have to target anything. Um, so you can kind of see some of the costs. So I just add money to this machine that is this ad network. right? I give it a time frame and money, and it goes and kind of kicks in and, and, and does its thing. Um, so, I think at the time we, I gave it 25 bucks and said, "Hey, max out like a dollar a day, uh, and let's see what happens." Or the, it, when I took the screenshot, it was 12 dollars, right? Because I was feeling frisky or something. Um, I think the, the the funniest part about this entire screenshot, do you guys see this little table here? The last 10 days of activity. Um, the first day I ever did it, I got 8,000 impressions. Right? It cost me four dollars. I got 15 clicks. <laughs> I, well, we didn't want the clicks. I didn't, want the clicks. I didn't even try to get anyone to click. I'll show you the ad in a few slides. It, it was not something worth clicking on. I didn't even. Oh, anyway. Um, yeah. So, so this is pretty cheap. You can kind of see uh, other things that they're they're kind of talking about, right? Um, you can run multiple campaigns. This was another thing I had to kind of wrap my brain around. You're running ad campaigns, so. I, I, was, I only ever ran one, but you can run multiple of these simultaneously and generate a lot of different things uh, all over. Um, so here was the fun part. Here's the text box to enter your code. Great, thank you for this text box. Uh, there was a few options. It was either give them an image and a URL or click on the HTML slash JavaScript thing here to just write your own HTML and JavaScript. So of course I was going to do that. Um, so. I, uh, we were kind of tweaking our, our code a little bit as we were writing this, uh, just trying to figure out how to make sure that the connections were opening up before we really cranked it up and tried to loop through as many as we can per browser, just making sure that we had a browser on our side that we could see the connections coming in. But um, this is a good time to talk about their approval process. <laughs> every time that, yeah, there is approval process. Uh, every time that you changed uh, this code or anytime you changed anything in the ad, it needed to be approved. Okay. Um, approved basically meant for them, but it was an actual human, so there was a, a time delay here. I had to wait for a human during business hours to go in, look at it, and approve it. So it was kind of annoying to me. But their approval process was, is it an image that fits in the box that I gave you, and when I click it, does it actually go somewhere? Approved. Okay? They didn't, they didn't care about anything else. Those are the two criteria. And I'm sure, yeah, if it was like, nudity or something like that, they'd make sure that it was in the right channels. But for me, it was, does this image fit in this box, and if you click it, does it go somewhere? So we were tweaking this code, and I just really didn't want to keep waiting for this person on the other end to keep approving it. So can anyone spot the change that I made here? <laughs> I went from writing my JavaScript in the box to? Oh. Scream it out. Someone say it. What I do? Source. Script source. <laughs> Script source equals here's my external JavaScript file, right? So instead of writing my code directly in the ad and getting it approved every time, I just sourced in a file and I can edit that file as much as I want on the back end. Never got reapproved whatsoever. So even if some mythical day in the future ad networks decide to hire an army of static code analysis who are really good at JavaScript and they analyze my code and they say, yeah, this guy's not doing anything bad, as soon as it approves, I can switch it, right? There's, there's just no way to kind of keep, keep on top of that scalably. Um, here's my ad. Get a 30 day free trial. Claim now. <laughs> 15 clicks. For what? Yeah, 30 day free trial for what? I have no idea. This is actually, 
This is the ad off of the White Hat homepage because I was lazy and just went to the homepage. I was like, I need a banner ad. What? I think it's <laughs> safe to say like every single one of those clicks was fraudulent. Yeah, I was like, hey, we're paying for this. I might as well actually advertise for my company, right? And then I like, it wasn't until later that I didn't realize that it doesn't say White Hat in the picture. Like, <laughs> it says nothing. It says 30 days free. Um, so you can see which ones were approved and not. And I just, I was like, hey, here's an image. Just throw it in all these boxes. I just want this code in browsers. I don't care about what it looks like or anything like that. They cared about what it looks like. Um, but you can see all of these got denied except for the one that fit in, in the box, right? Um, so from the, the code from the connection limit bypass, uh, that we were talking about, right? That was one browser, that was one Firefox browser pointing at one instance of Apache. We were like, okay, what if we, we're gonna do this in the ad network now, uh, let's point it at an Amazon instance <laughs> of Apache, that's uh, ourselves, distribute our code through the ad network and just try to generate as much traffic from the ad network just loading image tags to me, to myself as possible and see when I, see if I can DOS myself. Um, so this was the code. Really, really complicated. So you know, we're just looping through and creating any PhDs in the room that could read this and analyze it for us. <laughs> it's just ten thousand image tags going to our Amazon AWS instance. So we did ten thousand again because we wanted to measure while we were looking at the logs. We wanted to get a feel for how long our code was running in the browser, right? Because in the ad network, that's not guaranteed. Remember that was the other one, uh, the browser renting thing. So uh, this one, it was like, okay, let's loop it to 10,000 and see how far towards 10,000 we get, right, in one browser. Again, we started with just the HTTP, so we're not doing the connection bypass limit. So this is just six or seven at a time uh, of these images coming out of, out of the web browser, and we want to see how close to 10,000 we would get. A few times we got close, most of the time we were in the few hundreds uh, to, to low thousands. Um, so, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds-ish. 30 yeah. seconds um, per browser, I guess, on average. All right, you want to sure. do this? So uh, we have demo here because we did this live the, the, at one point. This is similar as, before, as the video. This is our Amazon AMI instance. If you just went to the status page, this is what you'd see. The number of simultaneous requests. We're going to focus here when we did it. Uh, and traffic, uh, how much traffic we're sending. And then up top there, you see the web server logs and... So it was keep clicking through. So five simultaneous requests, so the campaign's kicking off, so we're hitting five simultaneous requests. We're kicking off this campaign too at the same time, so we can just keep clicking. So this is the browser minute uh, sharing service that as soon as you turn that on, it starts generating traffic for you, like immediately. That was another thing that was good about it. But it wasn't a lot at once, it wasn't a flood, right? It was kind of uh, a trickle. Uh, but it was cool that it was immediate. So we turned it on and you see eight minutes later, we had generated uh, 4,000 hits to our, our website in eight minutes. Right there, 4,130 total active. Five at a time, that's, that's one browser currently, right? You'll see that go up a little bit if it's multiple browsers at the same time, but. So now it's 10 minutes in, we're at 15,000 total accesses, five simultaneous requests. Oh, so this was funny. So how many of you are familiar with Phantom JS? Neil here. Neil, Neil wrote Phantom Gang, which is really cool. Check that out. Um, so Phantom JS, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a headless browser. Uh, so it looks like people are, so it's one of two scenarios here. Either people are gaming the system. So the, uh, I forgot to mention this. In the browser renting service, there was two ways to get browser time. You could either pay them or give browser time for browser time. So you could just say, hey, yeah, I'll load my browser up and look at this URL. In exchange, I'll get browser time you know, to, to use for myself. So two situations here that PhantomJS would start showing up in our logs uh, through this service. Either people are gaming that system, right? People are scripting browser time to gain minutes out of them, or that service is gaming us, right? And it's not actual browsers, it's PhantomJS loading our things. For our purposes, it didn't matter, right? Like, we just want connections open. I didn't care if it was Chrome, Firefox, PhantomJS, or anything like that. So that was just cool thing that we saw. So moving on, we're 15 minutes in, 28,000 uh, connect, not 28,000 simultaneous, 28,000 total so far in only 15 minutes. Uh, 22 minutes in, it's at 61,000, so we're getting pretty good. 33 simultaneous requests, so we're getting there. Uh, then we're 25 minutes in, 82,000, 19 simultaneous requests. The advertising network still hasn't kicked in so far, so you'll see that come up. This is all the browser minute sharing service. So we're up to a half an hour, 100,000 requests, nine simultaneous. Go ahead. You want to generate some hits to your website, right? 
And uh, let's see, where are we at here? We're at uh, 45 minutes in. It starts to kick in, 133,000 total. The advertising network kicks in, and we just we immediately pin the, the Apache web server at 255 simultaneous requests. So we dosed it with the ad network, just one Apache, and it cost us less than 25 bucks. We're thinking probably per hour on the ad network this way, you can, you can, uh, you can take down one Apache server for about 5 to $10 per hour. So this, again, this is all just a connection uh, flood, right? We're just trying to open as many simultaneous connections as possible to a web server. So it's not a traditional denial of service where it's usually measured in gigabits per second. All right, how much data could I throw at this web server? So you're like, okay, well, we were just requesting some 404 page. What happens if we request something that actually has some data size to it? So we decided the ass badge was the good way to go yeah. uh, as a JPEG. And in the, in the, you can see in, in 10 minutes here, we go from 43 minutes, we had 133,000 hits, but only 36 megs right of there. transfer, right? Because that was just 404, 36 megs of 404 pages. Yep. Uh, 10 minutes later, we were at 100 megs of traffic with just this kind of silly little JPEG. So we're like, oh, okay, this, we probably could generate some, some serious uh, data uses also. But keep in mind, we were paying for our own bandwidth in, in Amazon, so. <laughs> yeah, we're, we were, we're billing ourselves at this point. Yeah, uh, yeah now it's half a gig. Our quarter gig, I'm sorry. This was two, minute, two minutes later, though. Yeah. <laughs> Another 100 megs in two minutes. Uh, now we're up to almost a gig and an hour total elapsed. Five minutes after that. So, yeah, it's, it's picking up speed with just that little image. And right now, the, the web server is just barely hanging on this at this point. So now we waited. We just said, you know, we're good here. Let's just wait it. So we waited another seven hours, and then we got it up to total, total transfer of over uh, 100 gigs. How many hits is that? Oh, uh, oh yeah, total hits. Well, we're probably slowing ourselves down, but that total hits is, what is that? 4.3 million. 4 .3 million. I need commas. Yeah. Uh, seven million uh, and two, a quarter terabyte of transfer in 16 hours. So that's kind of expensive on the web server at that point. Especially because you're not spending much on the ad network side the destination spending a lot. Uh, so we keep going here, 18 hours. Uh, one day, uh, one day, one, about a little over a quarter terabyte and 11.4 million total accesses. Still got more, I was still counting up. We, were, we, we basically pinned our Apache server for, for uh, the whole day. So yeah, then we started to kill it off and we're all good. Um, so we spent $35. <laughs> on the ad network. And we were, um, so we were being polite to ourselves. We had a lot of minutes left, right? So, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, right there. I had bought 10000 I would bought 10000 for $12. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, think we, I think we bought another 10000 because I think... Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. yeah, we did e-commerce at Black Hat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not, not advisable. Um, so, okay, we can, we can DOS our own Apache server, right? We proved that pretty easily. So we can, we can, we can DOS someone with no DOS protection, basically. So that was where we ended that research for a few months. But we, we really wanted to know, okay, can we generate like an actual, like could we take down an actual website that had actual denial of service protection, right? So we thought of, okay, who, who is one of the largest denial of service protection companies out there? Let's maybe ask them for some assistance. So we went to Akamai. We said, hey, Akamai, we have this thing. We'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to try to do this. It's a very strange combination. Hear us out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we asked for a server that we could possibly point our, uh, our, our browser botnet at that was potentially running through Akamai pipes so we could see if we would even move the needle for them, if, how much it would cost to move the needle for them. So uh, Michael Smith over at Akamai, uh, great guy, helped us out a ton. Uh, he said, yeah, I think I have one for you. It's called www.akamai.com. So, uh, so this is awesome. We had tacit permission to DOS Akamai.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was on the line. We had to get a jail free card, and we, uh, and we pointed the botnet at, at Akamai.com. At this point, we said, let's spend some money, right? Instead of $35, let's actually throw, I think we threw in 100 bucks, right? Um, and let's see, 100 bucks and max <laughs> daily spend, like, only 100 bucks. It's still only 100 bucks, right? But let's get crazy. Um, so this was the time period that we, uh, we sent these requests over. Uh, so kind of at the beginning there, at the beginning of the graph, that's Akamai's normal web traffic, right, where it starts. And then this whole mess is what we generated. Um, 
the, the scale there on the left, for those of you who can't see, is, uh, is uh, what is that, requests? So, so that, the, the blue line, that's rules triggered, HTTP rules, that we're doing something weird, and the yellow line is uh, request. request denied. On the scale here, that's 200,000 and 400,000. So we exceeded 200,000 simultaneous requests during that moment in time. Can your Apache server do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I put in the hundred dollars. So again, you remember how it took forty-five minutes to kick in. You don't really have full control over when the ad network is going to actually give out these impressions and run your code. It took forty-five minutes to kick in. It's kind of lumpy. It's it kind of it's kind of lumpy with internet traffic, right? Like when are people online uh, seeing those ads? Uh, so this was kind of like let's throw a hundred bucks at it. Tell it that it can spend a hundred bucks in the next day and see see what happens. I, be I believe that drop there. That was the FTP, right? No, that's that the next slide. Okay. Um, so you can kind of see here. This is just this this little time window right here, uh, extrapolated over this this whole thing. Um, so in our in the first time that we did the research, we never actually deployed the FTP Firefox connection bypass in the ad network because we were scared <laughs> to do that. Uh, so we we just did the HTTP. We just did six at a time. So the whole thing here, we were just hacking ourselves the whole time, right? So I never wanted to negatively impact any person that would load my ad. So I was just requesting images normally, right? This time we just got too curious to not, right? So we were like, okay, let's deploy the FTP uh, code to the ad network while it's pointed at Akamai since we have all these pretty graphs. So we started, we, you know, we didn't do the FTP code at first. You could see at the beginning of this graph, okay, first of all, normal Akamai web traffic. <laughs> that whole portion, right? All the, the three hours, normal Akamai web traffic, right? I feel like it's a fairly popular website. Um, then we kick in, we turn it on. We, uh, that's just normal HTTP. We're like, hey, let's see what happens when we flip over to FTP. It goes dark. Invisible to them. I can't Akamai see it. didn't even <laughs> see it. So we were still holding those connections open, but we were not triggering any rules on Akamai or even, or anything, right? Uh, we didn't dump enough money in there to cause them a headache, right? So, we're, so say we're say we're twice this, right? Say we're even twice above this graph if FTP was very successful. Um, remember, FT, the FTP bypass only works in Firefox, so that you know that has, that plays into it. How, I, many, how many browsers are? Out I there? feel we have to state again: we're using one campaign on one crappy ad network, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and so, but the FTP thing only works on Firefox. We weren't sure, like, how much. So I, I was actually kind of sad that this was invisible, but even though it's kind of cool that it's invisible, I, I really wanted to see how much this would have spiked more if that connection limit was gone in Firefox, outbound connection limit. But alas, we just have a really cool invisible attack instead. Um, so uh, they said, yeah, we have one more pretty picture here. Uh, so this is our attack again. That first dip is, is the FTP, and then we, we go again for the next couple hours until Michael basically begged us to turn it off because he was <laughs> getting yelled at by other people. He said, this was actually really cool. I got alerted a lot like uh, from other parts of the company that didn't know this was going on. So he's like, oh, at least that works. This is great. Well, they, they, they noticed an exceedingly large DOS attack, and he was getting notified going, what's going on? He forwarded <laughs> us an email chain. He's like, ah, oh, you guys <laughs> made some trouble. But it's kind of interesting. Like the moment he said turn it off, it like we just turn it off, and the ad network traffic goes away, and it goes reduces to zero like really fast. So uh, in talking with him um, uh, about okay, so how did we do? Right? Did we cause you like obviously we set off alarms, but your website was still fine. We never actually took it down. Uh, I believe the number he said was uh, I think we hit roughly a third of what would have caused them some headaches. Okay, um, so think if you run multiple campaigns over multiple times, or even dump more money in this and try to spike like, it, even like three hundred dollars. Yeah, three hundred dollars, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Whoa, 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 did you just do math up here? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's like a third of a bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> We need to update our oh, economic yeah. slides. I could, to, to I could do Bitcoin, Bitcoin math. <laughs> uh, so these were some notes from from Michael when uh, when he he co-presented uh, some of this this updated research of uh, why this was a cool attack compared to other denial of service attacks. Um, so these are these are kind of things that we talked about why attack this way, right? Um, 
So yeah, we had really good distribution. We hit where IPs from all over the place. So it wasn't like knowing bad networks and weird ISPs. These are real users on DSL networks and at work and all sorts of things. They were overlapping with legitimate uses and users. There was no spoof sources. We weren't spoofing a thing. This is real traffic. The refer signature was legit because it was a browser coming from real locations. Um, and yeah, they couldn't measure the FTP method because it went dark. That's a really good method. We also learned some other things that we're going to hold back. So <laughs> the, uh, the, the important bullet here, I think, to focus on is the overlap of legitimate users, right? So one of, the, one of the best ways to, or one of the popular ways to protect against this kind of thing is to start trying to block the bots that are causing this bad, excuse me, this bad traffic, because uh, usually they're not going to ever be legitimate users on your site, so just block them and can go away. Uh, here, I mean, these are normal people using their browsers and you know it could have been it could have been us it could have been any of you guys that just were on the website and an ad loaded and it ran our javascript right so if they started blocking you guys that would not work right they, you can't do that um, so uh, one other just kind of headline here, I'll let you talk sure. about this. So uh, we're doing this research and it just so happens that there's this open X piece of software it's a uh, start your own advertising network and it just a has, happens to have a, a vulnerability in it. So uh, you can also you can always uh, you know if you can't use the advertising network to for your on your own behalf you can always hack them. <laughs> so who knows like cPanel? You guys familiar with cPanel? This is kind of cPanel for advertising networks, right? Instead of like hosting providers and stuff like that. So uh, this software that some advertising network admin panels used had a phone, so you could just hack the ad network and get your ad in that way. We just decided to give them money. <laughs> so we're pretty confident in saying so right now with the way the system currently works. We can hit the slide. With the way the system currently works is that if you're not using a CDN of some kind, somebody like an active DDoS protection, a little bit of money in the advertising network will just wipe down anybody. So you're going to have to CDN it if you hope to stay stable because a targeted attack like this, there's just no way you're going to be able to you know, withstand that amount of traffic. And I'm constantly reminded by this tweet, you know, I'm always, you know, tweeting out there about different web security challenges. And I remember this one that uh, Kaminsky sends my way. He goes, nobody's breaking the web, dude. Not now, not ever. And so far, he's been right. And, uh, and that's what we talk about here today, that if you look in the entire eco ecosystem of, the, of what we're doing, everybody is playing by their own set of incentives. It goes right by uh, what, what uh, Robert Hansen said today. You know, the advertising networks, they're there to generate code. The guys that are running websites, they're there to show ads. There's no real fix that we're aware of for this problem. We know what the technological solutions, but the challenge is no one's in the position to actually do the right thing and protect the user and protect website owners. The website owners can't protect themselves, the users can't protect themselves, and the browser vendors certainly aren't going to protect you because they're in on it. They're making money as a result. So this is the real web security challenges out there. We have a lot of the technological solutions, but not on a lot of the incentives out there. So I think we're going to have to rethink what solutions, who we do business with, how we do business with them, because right now the web's broken because the incentives are misaligned. Yeah, this is usually the slide at the end of the presentation where we talk about how to no, we have no warm fix. and fuzzy and fix this. Install an ad blocker. Each other. Yeah.